the Mishcon Academy Digital Sessions. Welcome everyone and thank you for joining this Mishcon Academy session, part of a series of online and in-person events, videos and podcasts looking at the biggest issues faced by businesses and individuals today. I am Andrew Seneja, a partner in our real estate department and I'll be hosting today's event. Before I introduce my guests, there are some housekeeping rules and tips. If you have joined remotely, you have joined automatically and on mute without video. If you have questions, you can use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Any tech issues, please use the chat function. And if you're in the room, just use the old fashioned way of raising your hand. So why are we here today? Today is Time to Talk Day, which is the nation's biggest mental health conversation. Happening every year, it's a day for friends, families, communities and workplaces to come together to talk, listen and change lives. We know that talking about mental health reduces stigma, helping to create supportive communities where we can talk openly about mental health and feel empowered to seek help when we need it. That's why opening up the conversation about mental health is so important. By talking about it, we can support others and ourselves. So to mark this day, we're delighted to welcome Sajid. Sajid's a politician who served as Secretary of State for Health and Social Care in Ju June 2021 to Ju July 2022, having previously served as Home Secretary and Chancellor of the Exchequer. Sadly, in July 2018, Sajid lost his brother Tariq to suicide. Sajid believes the stigma around mental health prevents men from seeking help sooner. And I just wanted to touch upon some alarming stats before we speak. So 125 people die by suicide every week. That's 18 people a day. In 2021, there were over 6,000 deaths registered in Great Britain, where the cause was recorded as suicide. 75% of suicides are men. Men aged between 45 and 54 were found to have the highest suicide rate. And then there are regional variations, with the northeast of England having the highest rate. Among women, the age-specific suicide rate was highest in those aged 45 to 49. Women aged 24 or under have seen the largest increase in the suicide rate. Suicide is the biggest killer of young people aged 35 and under in the UK. So are we in the midst of the biggest mental health crisis? Thank you for coming. I know you're comfortable to share your story. So if you could please start and share your story with the audience. Yeah, well, thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me and thank you to Mishcon for, for doing this today, to bring everyone together on Time to Talk Day to, to talk about something that's so important. And uh, obviously we're focusing on suicide, but uh, just to say at the start that, that uh, your Time to Talk Day is all about encouraging uh, people, whether it's you know, yourselves, your family, your friends, uh, to, 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 to sort of reduce that. Sadly, there's a, sometimes there's a bit of a stigma about talking about mental health uh, challenges. And, uh, and especially so when it might come to you know, someone that might show signs of uh, suicide. And that's why it's so important to, to, to talk about it and to, you know, to, to look out for those signs, perhaps in your friends, family and others. Um, in, in terms of my own uh, experience, it was, uh, well, it was 2018. Uh, I was the Home Secretary at the time. And, you know, so very busy, lots of things going on all the time. And uh, I suddenly received a call from one of my other brothers. I had four brothers. I've got four brothers. And, uh, and, he, and he told me the news about our eldest uh, brother, uh, Tarek, who had uh, taken his own life. And, uh, and I was in shock because um, I think uh, not just for me, but for everyone in my family, uh, no one, we were all shocked. No one uh, saw this uh, coming at all in any way whatsoever. I'd seen Tarek probably uh, two weeks before that at a, uh, at a family wedding, and um, there was just no sign. Um, uh, and, um, and I don't know whether he'd made up his mind then or not, uh, but there, you, you're just left with a feeling for myself, and I think I speak for my, certainly my brothers, in the thinking, you know, if we'd known something was up, of course, we would have uh, tried to uh, talk to him and find out what the issues were. Why would you be thinking like that? And, uh, and, uh, and that's something I'm never going to get the chance uh, to do again. And, uh, and so that's why I just think it's, uh, it's not something that you want anyone else to, to go through. And that's why it's uh, something I've, I've, I've taken a really strong interest in, in, in suicide prevention ever since then. 
And so I know it, when you um, publicly mentioned this story last year, you talked about survivor's guilt. Um, can you please share what, what that means to you and how that affects your life in terms of that survivor's guilt? Yeah, it, 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 it just really means that um, just that, that real constant thought, I'd say that, you know, is there something that you, know, you could have done? You know, because the, obviously we were closest brothers, you know, certainly when we were all growing up together. And, uh, you know, like any sort of close family, you'd, you'd share, you know, everything. You know, we talk about our girlfriends and we talk about, you know, who hasn't done their homework and, you know, uh, you know who's been naughty and all, you know, just as, 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 uh, as, as you would. Um, but um, as you grow older, obviously, we all, you know, start our jobs and have our own families and things and you naturally sort of talk less. Um, but we still talk, met as a family. I thought we were, I felt we were a very close family in, in some ways, but still, you know, I didn't pick up any signs. And, uh, and, uh, and so you, you, there's a, you know, quite regularly, I think, but especially at, at moments like when it's his birthday or something where I remember that we did together, or actually even sometimes when I just see a photograph, honestly, of him, uh, it just, I just, uh, I think that, yeah, I wish I'd done something. And obviously I can't, and it is uh, it's something you have to live with. There are many people in the room who will know that I also lost my brother to suicide in 2020. So um, this resonates with me, in particular, the survivor's guilt and thinking about whether I could have done something as well and similar story in terms of we were very close. I spoke to my brother just the day before he um, passed away and my mum spoke to him in the morning and there were no signs at all. So. It, it, it's um, it's something that impacts so many people, and, and one death can affect 135 people. The stats yeah. show. So um, it, it's this is why we're here today to talk. Uh, I want to talk about stigma and mm. and culture. You mentioned in one of your articles that um, there were people in the Pakistani community who had perhaps suggested that you should lie mm. about the circumstances yeah. surrounding your um, brother's death. Um, I just wanted to understand sort of those differences and why you think that is that people, um, especially certain cultures, find it very difficult to talk about mental health problems and in particular suicide. Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you for saying what you just said about your own experience. I think I can say that, you know, I, I for one certainly know the, the, the kind of thing you would have gone through in your uh, family as well. And uh, it's, uh, I, I, think, I certainly think it, it, you know, in sharing um, you know, what you've gone through, it will certainly help others uh, to focus on that. So thanks, yeah, I think it's very good of you to, to say that and share that. Um, in terms of the um, stigma, I mean, I, I think that there's, there's, there's a problem, sadly there's a mental health stigma, I think, across all, you know, many communities. Uh, I think that as a, as a country, society, that we've become a lot, lot better in, in talking about mental health challenges and dealing with mental health challenges. I mean, the NHS uh, you know, has today, both legally and otherwise, you know, has parity with mental health alongside physical health and things, and that's a, a relatively recent uh, change. Um, I do think, though, that in certain communities there is more of a stigma. I think, um, uh, you know, you call it the Pakistani community, I think you could probably extend it more broadly to what we might call Asian yeah. community. Um, and uh, and, uh, you know, I, I think that if I think again of my own experience that, you know, there were some people that told me, look, you know, obviously they knew uh, these are people that knew, um, you know, Tariq had taken his own life. Uh, but they said, we, we, you know, you shouldn't really talk about it and mention it. Why don't you just say it was an accident or something else? And I was personally, I was completely against that. I mean, it, 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 it was what it was. Um, no one wanted it to happen. But I think if you try to hide it and pretend it was something else, uh, you're helping no one, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and and so quickly. Certainly, in my own sort of immediate family, then everyone agreed with uh, the, the the views I had. They were in the same place, um, but I, I do think that it, it just uh, sort of showed me that in some communities, I think there's more work to be done to support uh, uh, and and show that why it, it is the right thing to do to talk about things openly, especially if you want to have a, a focus on prevention. Well, um, 
again, this resonates with me. My mum was convinced, even though my brother had taken his own life by suicide, that he had died of COVID. I'm not quite sure why she linked the two, but we happened, we were obviously living yeah. in the COVID area and she was convinced that COVID had something to do with it, even though he didn't actually have COVID at the time. So um, it was just trying to yeah. pin it on something else that wasn't this. And um, so even to this day, she sometimes mentions the same thing. So. Um, Yes, that is um, something we need to tackle. In terms of mm. how you deal with people now, how, how has it changed your interaction with people? Uh, if you feel that people are struggling and are you more um, aware of signs? Do you look out for signs in, in other people and feel that you... Uh, yeah, I, think I, I do. I do uh, more. Um, and not just, uh, I'd say, not just um, sort of mental health yeah. uh, signs. Uh, um, you know, for example, just just literally just right now on my way here in the taxi, uh, someone who works for me texted me and, and, and she said that, uh, you know, she's, she's got to go to hospital on, on one of the days and, and she might be a bit drowsy the next day because the medication and, and so, you know, her work might not be up to scratch the next day. And I just said, just take the whole day off. It's, a, it's a like, take it, it's take it as paid leave here because there's nothing more important uh, than your health. And, uh, and you know, and what I, I think what we can all do, and that's why I think it's important to have workplace events like this, is, is you know, I, I think you don't have to be a health specialist to, to sort of spot signs and uh, concerns amongst your friends and, and, and colleagues uh, at work. You know, uh, you know, you're all smart people here. Yeah? That's one reason you're working at Mishcon, right? You're all smart people and you can all... You, know, you, can, you can spot signs and changes in people, changes in behavior, and there are some um, risk factors. Uh, you, know, you talked about uh, some of those earlier. It might not apply to people here, but you might know others where you, know, you talked you know, first about you know, men are more likely. Yes. Uh, obviously, you know, sadly, lots of women and girls you know, commit suicide, far too many, but, but uh, men are more likely statistically. Um, you know, three quarters of uh, registered you know, suicides um, there's a regional differences. Yes, you absolutely. talked about the Northwest. I think you're two times more likely in the Northwest. There's obviously a link to deprivation. So if you look at sort of the more deprived uh, community economically versus the more affluent, there's a 10 times uh, increase in risk. Another uh, of you know, risk factors, which I don't think would surprise anyone here, would be things like um, anyone that's uh, sadly suffering from domestic abuse of, of, of any kind. Uh, is, is, is far more likely. Um, uh, sadly, people in the LGBT community yes. are, are, are there's a higher risk of, of self harm and, and, and suicide. So, there are um, well known risk factors uh, out there. Uh, alongside those, I think if you spot just change in behaviour, I think the only, the best thing that we can all do is just talk to someone. Yes, absolutely. Just talk. It's not difficult, right? It's and lawyers love talking, don't they? <laughs> so it can't be very difficult. Yeah, we do love. You get paid for it, right? Yeah, yeah we do. Or by the hour. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I want to talk about your role in government, mm. um, and I know that you have made it your mission to try and tackle this issue. And you've spoken about um, a ten-year suicide prevention plan. Yeah. And I just want to um, know. Obviously, I know that you're not going to stand up for re-election. Mm. Um, but what are you going to do now until then um, to help this issue in terms of your role? In yeah, so the, so the good news, the, although I left um, you know, my role as health secretary, yeah. the government's committed uh, to this sort of new plan. And, uh, and, the, and the government's recently, the, the health secretary has recently uh, just confirmed that. Uh, in fact, I was chatting to the minister that's responsible for it just last week, and, uh, and she's very much sort of on top of it, and, and, and it will happen. The reason I thought... You know, government needs a, a sort of proper sort of long-term plan is because I think that you know, too often when it comes to government trying to solve, not solve, but trying to help with issues, the, the, the government machine tends to sort of say, look, it's the responsibility of, of one department. So this obviously would be health department. But I've learned just in my time in government that actually many of society's biggest challenges uh, they are cross-government, right? and government doesn't always come together in to try to deal with a challenge. So it, by having a, a cross-government sort of long-term suicide prevention plan, what it means, although it's sort of led by the health department, as it should be, is that you get other departments involved that have a big role yeah. to play, and it can make a big difference. So you know, think of uh, the Department of Education, 
uh, think of uh, DCMS you know, in terms of its responsibility for the online world. Think of um, the Department for Work and Pensions, you know, because the link with deprivation yes. and, and, and things. So, you know, basically, actually, I think if you think about every government department, the, I think they've all got a role to, I think all the government departments I've ran, they've all got a role to play in yes. this. And, and I think this time we can have a properly joined up, thought through suicide prevention plan where government is doing its bit, but also involving you know, civil society yeah, as well. There's many good yeah. charities that operate in this Absolutely. area, communities, workplaces like this, I think, to try, just try and leverage that yeah. and bring it all together. So there was the recent announcement in terms of the £150 million package of support yeah. for mental health services, which I think you announced while yeah. uh, in your role, but they've mm. announced how that money is going to be allocated. Uh, how, how do you think this is going to help um, prevent suicide and raise awareness? And just in particular, I think there's a statistic out there that yeah. I think two thirds of people who um, take their own lives are not actually known yeah. to mental health services and, and are not presenting with any particular issues. So do you think any of this money can help them and does it relate to going back to the communities and supporting people before they get to that point? Yeah, so, so you're right. The, the um, research shows, as you say, about two thirds of people yeah. had, have had no uh, contact with uh, mental health services or any support services which immediately tells you that there's a lot more to be done to sort of reach out. So the, the funding you refer to, and that's an increase in funding, yes. the total sort of funding that goes into mental health, it's, it's, in, the, it's in the billions. Um, and uh, and the, the purpose of the increase was to target it more at uh, suicide prevention yeah. and, uh, and, and, and do it in two ways. And, and you know, one is that through, through the NHS and through its own services so that if people are asking for help that can come more quickly than otherwise. Um, and the second thing is, is to provide support and you know, resources to some of those fantastic charities out there that, are, that, that are, um, you've been doing work, good work. You know, take, take the Samaritans, for example. I'm sure we've all heard of the Samaritans. I visited them a couple of times and stuff. They have great people, lots of volunteers, manning phone lines and, and things like that. And uh, to support um, that kind of activity so that if someone does think about the, uh, you know they need support and they call a hotline a number um, uh, then they will get a response i mentioned uh, there's another great charity out there it's called shout yes. right where it's a texting yes. service right and it's been enormously successful for the few years that it's been run i mean in some ways almost too successful in that they need that they're getting so many people texting them young people yeah. in particular and you mentioned earlier about you know yeah. and rightly so that you know suicide surprise. Is the, is the biggest killer yeah. of under 30, under fives. I mean, just think about that. For, for under 35, it's the biggest killer. I mean, most people are, would be rightly surprised by yes, that, right? Absolutely. So, you know, part of government's job, all of our job is that obviously we don't, you know, if yeah. there's any avoidable harms out there, we want to try and, you know, uh, prevent them. Um, and uh, so with organizations like Shout, like Samaritans and stuff, it's about supporting them as well. Yeah. And I went on to the NHS helpline today, obviously that refers to Shout as well or mentions yeah. the text message service, but we know that I think there's a survey about 20% of calls go unanswered at the moment in terms of the NHS helpline. And is that money, will that money be used to help the, that NHS helpline? Yeah, so some that of it calls will, some, yeah, will, some of it go will unanswered. but you know, the, um, the, I mean, I'd love to say that the, you know, the, we can get to a world where the NHS can answer you know, yeah. calls like that all within yeah. you know, 30 seconds or something, but there's so many demands uh, on the NHS uh, yeah. at the moment, yeah. not least because of the, you know, the, the aftermath of the pandemic, but there's, there's also a lot more support uh, going into it as well. But I think alongside the NHS, it's also really important to have the, the, the charity groups and, and, and civil society groups as well, yeah. because Often, actually, you find some people are more comfortable you know, contacting you know, third-party organisations yeah. rather than yeah. um, the NHS or what they might see as the state. And if that's their view, then fair enough, as long as they're getting help. Uh, you mentioned the online world as part of this um, talk today. I did a little bit of research, and I think if people looked at my search history over the last couple mm. of weeks, they'd probably be very alarmed. But with my Google searching, thankfully, I didn't actually come across any um, pro-suicide or pro-self-harm websites. It was all directing me to help services. 
But I know that that's not always the case um, in the online world, and, yeah. and I'm not using Instagram and uh, Twitter, Pinterest for this kind of um, research. Mm. I limited it to Google, but I do know that people use Google to search methods um, of how they're going to take their life. And then we've heard of harrowing circumstances mm. in terms of Molly Russell and um, the inquest in terms of how Instagram and Pinterest played a part in her taking her own life. Yeah. We have the online safety bill mm. going through at the moment. Do you think it goes far enough uh, in terms of um, how it's been framed? I just in particular, the distinction between legal and harmful and under 18s and over 18s. I think the chat, some charities say that the bill doesn't go far enough. Just wanted to hear your views yeah, on it. Yeah, so I've, I've long felt that um, we need to do a lot more as, you know, as we as in the, the government needs to do a lot more uh, to protect people online, particularly yeah. young uh, people. Uh, and I first sort of thought that sort of properly when I was the culture secretary and, and, and sort of uh, looked at it more closely. And then when I became home secretary, I was convinced by this because of some of a lot of what I was seeing on the online world or what was being brought to my attention, especially what you said, but also things like your terrorist content and yes. things. There's just a lot of nasty stuff. Now, I think, I think the online world is fantastic. It's transformed our lives in such a positive way and it's great, but there's also a lot of rubbish and harmful stuff uh, on it as well, and governments can do more. That's why I was, when I was Home Secretary, I uh, introduced the white paper that's led to this, this bill now. So your question, does the bill go far enough? Um, probably not, it's not perfect, um, but you know, I accept that there's always gonna be some sort of um, a, a process to, to, to get to a better place, and I think that's what it does. It gets us into a much better place once it becomes uh, law. And uh, in this area, like what we're talking about, especially protecting children, I think broadly it's in the, in the right place, which is that the priority is children, so anyone yes. under 18. And so there's a whole bunch of stuff there that uh, will be you know, effectively banned yes. and with, with you know, significant penalties yes. for, uh, for non-compliance. Um, where I think it probably doesn't go far enough, it's still much better, is uh, for what's often referred to as um, uh, harmful but legal, legal yeah. uh, content. So think of the sort of 20-year-old, 21-year-old uh, looking for information on how to take their own lives yes. or, or, or just being um, you know, really badly bullied and being told to take their own life, you know, because that's what sadly you know, some people do, yeah. and anonymous people typically on the internet. And, uh, uh, and they've got to opt out of yes. under this bill. And I'm, I would have preferred an opt-in. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but still, I think it brings us into a, a, a much uh, a better place. And, uh, and we've seen enough evidence of the online world playing a real role in, in, in suicide. And you've mentioned uh, the, the tragic case of Molly Russell. Yeah. And you know, I've met her father and, uh, and, uh, and you know, I have an understanding of some of the things that she was seeing. You know, yeah. Thousands and thousands of pieces yeah. of material. I mean, it's inundated. horrific. She was horrific. And, yes. uh, and you know a youngster a young person you know cannot sort of you know, manage that yeah. right because they're, they're young mind they're influenced 14, right it's yeah. A, yeah and yeah. so and their parents often just don't know yeah. what, what what is happening of course they don't know and uh, and so that's why i think there is a duty uh, through the, to the companies themselves but also sort of regulation and stuff to to try and sort of prevent that kind of information in the future Talking about children, um, you'll know the three dads walking. Yes, and I've met them. Yeah, um, yeah, and for people who don't know the three dads walking, they are three ordinary dads whose um, daughters um, died by suicide and they now have a campaign for suicide to be spoken about in schools in a open way, in an age appropriate way and in a safe way. That petition um, is being debated, I think, in March. Um, and I think yesterday at the um, PM's question time, um, Rishi Sunak said that he is, will be meeting these three dads. Yeah. Uh, what's your view on um, suicide being taught in schools? Because obviously this harmful content is around. 
our, our children um, think children need this further teachings and, and I go back to my own son who's 10 when we told him about my brother we used I don't even think we used the word suicide and he mm. just came straight back at me and used mm. it and he was eight at the time mm. and I was astounded that he even even knew what that word was mm. and um, so clearly I think there's a need for children to have that awareness yeah. in a safe yeah. way yeah so I mean, I, I agree, and yeah. I um, I've met the these the the, the three dads, and uh, you know, I met them last year, and as you say, they you know they all got their tragic stories uh, of how they lost their daughters, and at first I think it's just great that they've taken um, you know their experience and turned it into something so positive, and uh, and I think it will lead uh, to some change, and it's great that Rishi's going to meet with them because I know Rishi takes this issue very seriously, and. Um, and, and I can see some change coming across that. The only thing I'd sort of add to that is that you know, alongside you know, the children knowing more about suicide prevention, the things to look out for, um, I think there's a, just a broader issue around particularly online safety. Yeah. So it, 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 it's, in my mind, it's not just about uh, something as important as it is about suicide prevention. But it's also, you know, for example, uh, you know, um, children's access to legal pornography for adults, but illegal for children. And uh, so I'm very supportive, for example, of uh, age verification, online age verification, uh, so that you know, young minds aren't getting access to inappropriate material and things, because that can have a lifelong yeah. impact on them as well. And so I think there's a lot, there's a lot there. And what I hope the government does is sort of packages all that in a way where it can be maybe taught together but but it's taken more seriously than it is today yeah definitely i do agree uh, I, i'm conscious of time uh, so in terms of our corporate organization and um, what do you think organizations like mishcon and others can do to help our people and the wider community obviously we're here today this is one day what can what do you think we can do well i think a couple of things i think first of all what you're doing now it's really good. You're doing this, uh, having these kinds of chats more often. I think you've got it online as well. So yeah. your colleagues that can't physically be here can all take part of it. Um, and so I think that's good. And, and getting it around your intranet and things, you know, the, you know, on time to talk day and stuff. And just encouraging, I mean, um, the, you know, I think also the, in your organization, you know, I suspect that, you know, people work incredibly hard. I think the hours can be very long and, and things. It can be very pressured. Uh, the, the, uh, line of work, and no matter how um, the, you know strong you, you know someone might think they are, that, how strong minded they are, how tough they are, and stuff. You know, anyone can break, right? Anyone can break, and so so it's important for your organisation, your bosses, and stuff to others to sort of know that to make sure that they're looking out for the signs, they're providing support, you know, whether it's mental health support or just you know time for recreation yeah. to get their mind off things and stuff. And that's I mean, you've got to, as a firm that you've got a good track record on that, and and and, and this is. A good example but you can probably never do enough, enough to, yeah. on that so that's important the other thing i can just think is that uh i mean if i may is that i mentioned earlier uh, a couple of great charities yeah. that do a brilliant space uh, brilliant work in this space and you know samaritans was one uh um, i mentioned shout uh, there's another one called papyrus that, yeah. that's where i met the three men yeah. uh, three dads yeah. walking because it's a charity on, on male suicide uh, particularly they focus on doing a great job um, that, uh, I think if you can afford to, you know, give them a tenner each or something, I don't know, just to help them out because they're doing some great work. You know, I, I don't remember the stat, but I remember from Shout, it's something like every, uh, every pound or something is something like, you know, 20 phone calls that they can take. I mean, just think about that, you know, if you, if you can afford it, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great thing to do and a great way to support others, to help others. And do you feel that Parliament supports their own community? Do you feel that you um, have Not enough. enough, not enough. In fact, I've just, uh, just this last uh, month, I had a meeting with the Speaker who, who takes this issue very seriously and, and, uh, and it is public information, so I can say he lost his own daughter uh, to suicide a couple of years ago. And uh, he takes this issue very seriously and I met with him and his officials about um, better training in Parliament for both parliamentarians, but also I thought for the staff of parliamentarians that deal with the constituency cases. Uh, because, you know, uh, obviously working in parliament uh, is a high pressured environment and things as well. But as MPs, 
uh, particularly when you're back in your constituency and you're having your surgeries and stuff, you meet a lot of yeah. people, your constituents, and, and many of them coming to see you have, you know, they're in real trouble. Issues could be some real issues. And I think MPs, if they could spot the signs, and then they could then perhaps help their own constituents when they're coming to see them about maybe a, you know, a problem with welfare payments, but then sort of spot the signs and direct them and, and give them advice. So I think that kind of training in Parliament is important as well. Thank you. I think we've just about got enough time for some questions. Nick. So just as a person that drives well-being... Okay. So just as a person that drives well-being here at Mishcon, first of all, a couple of comments. I just want to... Wow. I just wanted to commend both of you for your bravery, not only for talking about stuff which is clearly uh, very personal tragedies in your lives, but also the message that you're giving to all of us uh, in terms of the need to talk. Um, and I think that's vitally important. Here at Mishcon, we, sh we strive to sort of find a balance between getting people to take responsibilities for their own well-being, but in doing so, we need to provide an infrastructure of, of help and support and be able to signpost where necessary. And that clearly in includes this topic of, of, of mental health and, and suicide. I just wanted to add, I think you're right, there is the, you know, a need to talk, but I think there's also a need to listen. You, yeah. you mentioned about um, lawyers being very good talkers, and they are, and then we charge handsomely for it, especially here. Um, but we're pretty crap at listening, actually. It's counterintuitive. Yeah. And I think that that's really where we can make real strides to improve. When you ask somebody how they are, listen, maybe even ask again, how are you? Um, yeah. On a scale of one to 10, tell me how you are. How can you get to a, a better score? I don't know, but it's just a, it's more about, it's, it's equally as about listening than it is talking. And I think uh, that's, that's just a message that I would yeah. to put across. No, I, I completely agree. I mean, there's plenty of research out there and that you just ask someone, you know, just that, just what you said. How are you? How are you feeling today? Had a good day? Just that. Uh, even, three even, times. Sorry? Three times. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just that, that's, uh, people. Uh, it has such a positive impact on anyone, and, and you don't even have to know them that well. It could be a you know your waiter or waitress at a restaurant or something. It could be anyone, right? And uh, everyone would it can uh, respect everyone. It doesn't cost you anything to do that. We've got time for one quick question. Just there. thank you very much. Um, a lot of the uh, thank you very much. A lot of the discussions today have focused around the medical causes of uh, mental health and suicides and all that. But there is a very important societal cause um, that is a major contribution to this. And I just feel that we haven't really heard much from the government as to what's being done in terms of you know, inter uh, engaging with faith um, communities, other communities, because society can become quite a big, um, I think, um, uh, aid in preventing this and the recent COVID-19 experience where loneliness was such a big thing, um, everybody says that that really prompted uh, mental health and suicide issues. So what are the learnings we have had from COVID-19? Yeah, I, th I think that's right uh, as well. Um, if I think back my experience when I was the community secretary, your local government and community secretary, and the community's bit of that, there is, uh, and first there are a lot of, I think in the, in the UK, some really fantastic you know, civil society groups, many have been around for many years doing great work. Uh, but I also think that your government can do more to support them as well. And your, your um, the link to COVID, you know, you showed that uh, as well. And to carry, uh, and, and there is, it is worth thinking more about how do you keep that sort of COVID spirit of, of uh, cooperation Going. And I'll give you like one example, like in the NHS, there are many people that um, you know, had come forward to help, uh, not, as, not as medical practitioners, but to help the NHS maybe sort of pick someone from hospital, drop them off, you know, check on them afterwards, make sure they had food delivery and things like that. And those sort of volunteer, that volunteering and, and that the app that supported that and things, that's continued. Right? And, and many of the, and some of those volunteers have, have, have gone away, and fair enough, but many people have continued and, and stayed on much higher numbers than would have happened if it wasn't for COVID. So there are sort of some positive things, and it's a, I think that's the kind of thing you're talking about. Yeah. 
Thank you. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. Um, I just wanted to say one thing before we thank our guests, which is if you have time after this um, talk and you don't want to rush away to your, back to your computers, um, and if you're online, please do talk to each other, because that's why we're here um, to talk. Um, but thank you very much for coming. Really thank you very much. It. Really thank you all. Thank you. The Mishcon Academy Digital Sessions. To access advice for businesses that is regularly updated, please visit mishcon.com.